So, Tom, you ready to roll? Yes, sir. Dustin, we good to go? Good to go. All right, it is 9 o'clock, and a great big welcome on behalf of NDSU, Upper Great Plains, North Dakota Local Technical Assistance Program. It's my privilege to be with you today and welcome you to a, a great session of learning. What, uh, what we have for you is a three-part series. This morning from 9 till noon, we've got Tom Wood presenting on, on pavement preservation. This afternoon, we've got a great panel from Swanston and North Dakota LTAP and Brock White uh, providing information on best practices and equipment. And then tomorrow, for the lucky few that are able to join us in a live class and field demonstration, we're actually going to be practicing through different workstations what we've what we've been talking about, or we'll be talking about today. So that is the plan, and want to let you know who is helping to provide the training for us today. So we're North Dakota LTAP. We hope that, that you tap into us for all of your roadway learning, but we don't do it alone. The North Dakota DOT and Federal Highway are our big sponsors, and they're our big sponsors because they value what our cities, counties, townships, our local roadway network brings to the citizens, brings to the private business to keep our economy rolling. In addition, we've got a myriad of partners from the Dakota Asphalt Pavement Association all the way through. This is a partial list of the people that and companies that support you and your efforts in the field. So what are we really after? Continuous learning, that's what LTAP is. We've never, you know, the more I learn, the more I know that I don't know. To stop learning, it would just be crazy because there are so many new products. There are so many ways to do things differently. You know, in our office here, I happen to be in the Mandan Public Works building and, and I've got the Mandan Public Works crew with me and I've got Gerard is here too. Gerard's on our team for LTAP. And, and one of the things that Brian, uh, one of the leads here, talked about is if he can just hand off or pick up the few small tips, and we're certainly hoping that you pick up more than just one small or a few tip, small tips, but it's that continuous learning. And we want to be as LTAP, your road resource of choice. If you haven't been on our website, please jump in, learn from gravel to pavement to signing to leadership. It's all here. We, we believe that we're the best have the best resource page in the area for any local roadway. If you look at the join our email list, if you click that icon, put your email in, we'll send you notifications of training that we've got. Our learning management, the second blue icon down, gets you to a whole host of learning, training, videos, webinars that are recorded that you can watch on that day that you're not able to get in the field. And then like us on Facebook. If you want to see what we're doing, that's where we're posting our pictures and helping you understand what we're handing off or what those tips and tricks that others are using across the state. So please tap into this site. I, I hope that you add it as your, your homepage. We've got, as I mentioned, Gerard is in the room with us and he's gonna be part of the afternoon presentation and then out in the field this tomorrow, helping us learn how to preserve, how to identify uh, needs fixes, to understand when we should just bail, that, that small fixes aren't going to work, that we've got to reconstruct a segment, and then help us figure out how to get smooth right out of patches, things like that. He is our expert for the state, past Burley County paving foreman, and if you want him in your city, in your county, to help walk with your crew, work with your crew for a day, for more than a day, that's what he's here for. We want you to learn from the best. Gerard is one of our team members. Our Distress Identification Guide, it's a federal publication that we uh, shrunk down into a small booklet. Looks like this. The people that are in our class will get one of these on Thursday, tomorrow. And if you're not in the class, click on the link. It's online. It's a great source to show you pictures to describe the distresses, you know, the, the things that are going wrong with the street or roadway and potential fixes for your, your network. 
We also have an asphalt conference every year. If you haven't been to our asphalt conference, I strongly encourage that you do attend. Our asphalt conference is next April 6th and 7th. And learn, evolve, implement, and succeed is our mantra for that class. And, and the succeed, that's the part that we really want to hand off today, that while we can pick up some pointers, until we actually take those, make them part of our process, put them into our daily work, we're never going to succeed. So it's that full gamut. What we learn here in the next two days, sure, it's neat information. Sure, you might, might think it's cool, but until you make it mainstream, until you make it part of what you do, you're really never going to improve, improve and get to that success level that you, you're capable of. So today, this is the American Road Patch. It's the craziest product. It's, it's rolled roofing, it's rolled seal coat, uh, and, and you just put it down over a, over a deformation, over a, a pavement deformity, and try to keep some of the water out. It, it's one of the tools in the toolbox that help for preserving the roadway. And it's, it's an odd product. It seems so simple and so unlikely to work, but it absolutely has a place. So what we're going to be sharing in the next two days are things that, that work in certain locations. There is not a silver bullet. There are many ways to do things and every thing that you encounter, you need to assess what is the best practice. And so that's what we're gonna be sharing and help you understand. And then what's old is new again. Oh my goodness. So we go through, we'll go through different oils and we have all these wonderful oils with additives that, that allow us to reduce rutting to, uh, hold up in a crack, to adhere to the sidewalls on a crack, things like that. But you know what? Sometimes it's the old school stuff, the old oils. Sometimes it's the old processes that really, never, they, while they went out of vogue for a little bit, they still are the best option. So we have to combine the new materials, new technologies with what's been done in the past, that institutional knowledge, and, and figure out what works best. So. Every crew is the same. We have some experienced, long-term people, and we've got some brand new people. And what you have to do is hand off what you've done if you're experienced. And if you're new, you have to ask the questions. And then you have to read and look through different venues, whether it's online at our resource page or talking to Gerard, and mix the two so you all grow together as a team. And then innovation. So we're going to show some new New techniques, again, this American road patch, the roads rolled up seal coat, the rolled roofing that you put on a, a pavement. Very neat innovation. Equipment, oh my goodness, the equipment changes that are out there that allow us to do a better job. And we're doing a better job for the safety and the performance of the traveling public. That is our customer, and they are the ones rating us. My very favorite quote, if you can see all of it, cracks need to be sealed because where I come from, water can't jump. By our friend Tom Wood uh, from Minnesota at WSB and Associates. And, and this picture is, we know it. Water doesn't jump across the crack. Whether it's the crack at the edge of the curb line, it's the transverse crack on a roadway, a longitudinal deformation crack, whatever it is, we need to address those because water is the number one culprit of roadway problems. So crack sealing needs to be done because where I come from, water can't jump. I just love it, Tom. And Tom, so just a quick intro. So we hand it off to you. But Tom Wood, he is our pavement specialist. He worked at MnDOT and is now with WSB and Associates. They've got a Minneapolis office where he travels around the state helping WSB and contractors do a better job, and he still professes, professes nationally on, on items like we're going to see today on better pavements through better preservation. So with that, I want to turn it over to Tom Wood. And Tom, as you kick off, if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about your experience, because, well, you're a friend and uh, not everybody here knows you. So with that, Tom, you take it over. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. Thanks, everybody. Uh, oh, uh, like Dale said, I've uh, been around quite a while. I 
most important part of my life. I grew up on a farm. And so I sort of look at everything like a farm boy looks at it, you know, keep it simple, do it right uh, there. And uh, was a township road commissioner down in Illinois from 80, 1980 to 84. I had married a beautiful young lady uh, from Minnesota in 79. In fact, yesterday was our 41st wedding anniversary. Uh, in 84, she wanted to get her teaching license. She said, let's move back to Minnesota for one year where she went to college because it was cheaper. I asked her again last night when the one year was going to start. Uh, anyhow, went to work for MnDOT, started out as a maintenance worker, driving snow plows, patching potholes. Uh, one of my frustrations when I was at MnDOT back in the 80s was they would pave a brand new road and then they would let it just deteriorate to the point where it was potholes and stuff and i know that uh, dale and i were talking earlier and the number one concern for the traveling public is how smooth the road is and anything we do on that road needs to make it smoother than what it was before uh, Became a maintenance supervisor in 90, did that for about eight years, and then I was got the opportunity to go to the uh, MnDOT's Office of Materials and Road Research, working on preventive maintenance. First things we tackled was chip sealing, uh, crack sealing, and microsurfacing. Then we branched out into working with ultra-thin bonded wearing course and a lot of other stuff. And, uh, retired after 28 years, so I took a couple, three years off and worked for an uh, asphalt supply company and retired uh, before years ago in July and came to work at WSB in our uh, payment group. And what's neat about that is I basically are doing the same thing I did at MnDOT. I do troubleshooting and stuff and uh, and try to share my experiences and what I learned from other people. So. When Dale showed, and I forget what you called that product that you roll out on the road, and you said uh, new stuff is old, uh, it's interesting. We tried a product like that back in 1991. It worked very well, but the problem they had back then was the uh, primer that they had to put on the pavement was very hazardous material, and I'm assuming that they've figured that out. and and. I will tell you folks, look at what the old timers did. Figure out why they did it, what problem it solved, what deal it took care of, and then figure out why they quit doing it. And then look at new technology and see if you can take new technology and overcome the thing that kept them from continuing to do it. So, so type in questions. Uh, this is. Uh, going to be interesting there so i uh put this first slide up patching the never-ending job it shouldn't be you should be able to make a quality patch that will last until the pavement around it has failed in other words if you do everything right in my opinion and i used to patch on the interstate system in Minneapolis and St. Paul, 94, right through downtown and stuff. And I was proud of our crew. We can make patches that lasted until the pavement around them failed, and we can make the road smoother than what it was. And so that's the goal. So with that, uh, and Dale, flag me if you get a question. Will do, Tom. And, and audience, you are in the listen-only mode through your computers. And the question and answer, the Q&A session, section, please uh, add stuff in there. Even if it's just a comment on an experience, Tom would love to address it. So Tom, you're coming in loud and clear and your video looks great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, I, and I'm an old maintenance supervisor. So if you think I'm full of it, tell me and let's have a discussion because that's how we both learn. Pothole repair, temporary. I hate this word. It seems like, uh, you know, to me, it should be an emergency. It's Friday afternoon, 10 minutes before quitting time. It's raining hard. The 
somebody calls in and on your highest volume road, you got a wheel busted. You got a pothole out there. You don't have any hot, uh, hot mix. You don't have the time to get the crews out. It's raining too hard there. That's the only time a temporary patch should be done, in my opinion. The problem I see is so often I see people taking the time to put a temporary patch in when a little bit more effort to get a permanent one. And my pet peeve was when I ran night maintenance for MnDOT, we milled every patch out in the summertime. We patched them with hot mix. We did it right. I was there before the coronavirus deal hit. I'm flying back from teaching a class, and down by the Minneapolis airport, I counted seven MnDOT crash trucks to close two lanes of the interstate. And each one of those trucks had a person sitting in it, and at the front of the deal, there was a one-ton truck with cold mix on it, and they were just throwing the mix in the holes. And this was in the... This was in warm weather time, it was last fall, where they should have been doing a permanent patch. And I can guarantee you they were back within a week patching them again. So I don't want to see a show of hands, but throw and go is probably the poorest patching process you can do, in my opinion. And you'll see this pictures with water in the hole and stuff, and they're just putting it up high. If it does stay now, you got a bump. Uh, you get whip off from the cars and stuff. Studies have been Tom, done. That if you, go ahead. So, Tom, big deal. You get a little bump. You got a little patch. What, uh, what does the public care? Public ride is everything. Uh, if the public doesn't care if the road is concrete, asphalt, gravel, it could be gold as long as it's smooth. But if they get jarred driving to work and they spill their coffee, or for us old timers, their CD player skips there, and they have to, or they bend a rim, or they have to have an alignment, they're calling the mayor, they're calling the county commissioner, they're calling the governor and saying, what's wrong with this road? Right is number one deal. And a quality patch should ride as good as the road around it or even better if it's done right and gerard i'm, I'm sure is going to talk about that but they just uh, i can't stress it enough i years ago i was at a, a meeting in uh, the head of the head engineer for metro maintenance was uh in the meeting and they were talking about performance measures and stuff and they had bought they had bought a uh, truck-mounted slurry microsurfing machine, and they had done one of the high-volume roads, and they did a terrible job. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts. They took a reasonably smooth road and made it rough. Not sure how they did it, but they did it. Being the outspoken person I was, I mentioned there, and this lady said, well, yeah, but look at the tonnage they got done. Look at the tonnage they got done. I said to her, I said, it doesn't matter about how many times you get done, it matters about how good a quality you do. And lo and behold, about two weeks later, they let them uh, contract and had a micro milling machine come in and mill off all that good tonnage they got down and had a local contractor come in and teach them how to do it right. So, I mean, it's just the public doesn't have a long uh, patience for a rough road. It may be better out in the Dakotas than it is here, but around here, you know, if a, if you get a pothole at three o'clock and it they hit it again at four, they're they're complaining. So. Well, it's the same here in in the D Dakotas, Tom. Exactly yeah. the same. Now you, you talked about the entity having somebody, a contractor, come in to teach them how to do the smooth ride. You mean we can't teach ourselves? You know, uh, it's harder. Sometimes you need to have somebody come in and just show you the little things because what has happened and what, and I like I said I started out in maintenance and when I first got there at MnDOT and of course I'm out of state you know I had about seven strikes against me you know 
And the senior guys wouldn't tell me anything because in their mind, knowledge was power. And so, and of course, being a contrarian that I am is when they'd be doing something that I thought was stupid, I'd say, why do we do it? Well, that's the way we always do it. And for the folks that haven't been to my class, I'll have to tell this, this story right now. So a young couple gets married first Christmas. They're getting ready to have a ham dinner. The guy's helping his wife get the ham in the oven, and she takes meat cleaver and cuts a chunk off one end of the ham and throws it in the garbage can and puts the ham in the oven. He asks her why. She said, I don't know. Mom always did it. So he asks his mother-in-law, and she said, I don't know. Grandma always did it. So when Grandma showed up, he asked her, and Grandma said, well, I never had a pan big enough to cook the whole ham. And a lot of things get done. We do them the same way over and over again because that's the way we've always done it. Sometimes it's good to bring some outsiders in. And I've had the pleasure of being on the receiving side, and I've had the pleasure of being the giving side and, and gently say, hey, have you thought about this? You know, sort of build consensus because, you know, we go back to farm days when they used to have open pollinated corn. In other words, the one row of corn pollinated the other row of corn. And then all of a sudden they became hybridization where they took a completely different strain and then brought it in and cross pollinated it and look at the the performance of the yield of corn. Well, anytime, and I don't care whether it's a contractor, I don't care if it's uh, Dale and his crew, I don't care who it is, but you have somebody else come in, they got a different set of eyes, they got a different set of experience. And even if you don't totally agree with them, there's going to be one or two little things that you can use to cross pollinate or hybridize your your process. It just, you know, otherwise, you know, if, if we're not willing to change, we'd still be driving Model T's. Well, Tom, a good example in the Mandan Public Works shop, Brian showed uh, old, old school was that we'd come in and warm up the oil to do our work, right? Mm -hmm. And that means somebody's coming in early and it's extra hours and you're not actually getting anything done on the road. So uh, they learn from someone else because it's hard to learn from yourself. I'm not real self smart that uh, you could wrap that tote of oil and preheat it. And so they've got preheating jackets on their totes of oil, saving them a ton of time and getting them putting more hours on the road. So yeah, that learning, teaching, learning from others, you're spot on. It, it, it's critical. We fast track it. It's critical. People ask me why I love doing classes, and I really love doing them in person, And but because of the virus and everything else, I wasn't able to come up and join you guys. But every time I do a class, I end up learning something. Somebody brings up a, something that they've seen or they've done, and I go, oh, that fits over here. And, uh, you know, I just, it, it's so critical. So, so after, so I'm not a big fan of throw and go. The, I've read studies that the percent of patches that are still in on a high speed road on throw and go is less than 10% after a week. So you remember that first slide, the never ending job? Well, if you want job security, do throw and go. Now, there's been studies where you do your throw and go, but you roll it. Just with the dump truck, you got out there. You almost double the life and the performance of that patch. By just something as simple as if you've got a truck following you, have them drive over the patch. Am I advocating throw and go and, and throw and roll? The only time I'm advocating for throw and roll is if it's an emergency situation, you got called in at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night because you got a wheel buster and you got to fix it. Put the material in, don't throw it, place the material in, and then roll it with the truck you got there, or the pickup, or any, there, or it's going to greatly improve the performance. And it really doesn't cost anything, but if you double the performance, you know, that's huge. But Tom, I got mine. Gerard was recently helping one of our small communities on a on a patch like that, and they they did buy into the 
the rolling, the compaction, and they, they put a loader on it. And uh, Gerard quickly pointed out that the loader was uh, big enough, it was a big loader, that it was actually a detriment because obviously that pothole, that patch, that distress is there for a reason. There's a deformity in the subgrade in the pavement. Mm -hmm. And what he watched is that the pavement was deflecting around that crack because the subgrade was bad. And they actually ended up wrecking a larger section. So absolutely, we need density. But when you throw and go and you don't, don't address and do a permanent patch, it, you're, not, you're not really solving the problem. You're pacifying it for a short time. It, exactly. And, and to me, throw and roll fits in that temporary patch. You know, like I say, if it was less than 10% of the patches on throw and go last a week, and you double that, now we're looking at two weeks. You know, that's not very long. That's not very long. This next picture there, a friend of mine gave it to me. A uh, couple, if you look at the picture on the left, a couple of things that jump right out at me. Number one, look how high they're leaving the mix because they want traffic when it comes by to compact it. Well, the, the problem is that is a lot of that material is going to stick to the car tire and get whipped off. And if it does stay now, it's a bump and the public's not liking it. Beside the poor patching procedure, the thing on that upper left picture that drives me nuts is look where the guy's standing and look how much traffic control he's got. Now, this might be a 30 mile an hour road, but you know what? A car hits you at 30 mile an hour, it's not good. And then if you look at this lower right picture, and this is the concrete that's failed, and I've had good luck milling out concrete and placing asphalt back in there. They, they tend to pinch on you a little bit, but but you can see, and if you can see, Dale, can they see my uh, uh, mouse? I don't see it, Tom. Okay, well, if you look down at the bottom, right underneath the red circle on the right-hand side, you'll see a fresh patch that they might have done throw and roll. And then right next to it, you'll see a darker patch. You know, and so this road has been patched several different times. And to me, it, it, it's a candidate to come in and do something more permanent. So, so Tom, we do have a question. Yep. For those emergency, the wheel brakes uh, that we do need to do throw and go, how does a heated coal mix with, say, an MC250 oil compare to the, 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 the proprietary pothole in a bag? Okay, that, that's a great question. I was just going to get into that, so that's perfect. Um, we did a study at MnDOT several years ago, probably 15 years ago, that we never published. And we tried local uh, MC mixes. We had several hot mix contractors put up a cold mix pile. We tried UPM, PQR. I don't remember all the different ones. Uh, some of the things we found was, number one, if they got a good gradation in the, in the uh, locally produced material, you know, in other words, it sort of mimics the proprietary stuff, and it's got an anti-strip, they can perform pretty good. But uh, locally made material with the MCs needs to have an anti-strip because you're putting this material into a pothole full of water. And it's got high air voids. And so it's, you're never going to get it sealed to keep the water out of it. What was interesting on the study, we found that if we did a good job of prepping the potholes, in other words, we milled them out, cleaned them out, tacked them, all the mixes perform good. If we did a lousy job, the proprietary products perform slightly better. But the big takeaway I got from it was preparation was critical. But there, so on the slide I talk about it's available year round. No heat is needed. Uh, you can gently heat it; it flows better. I'm a big believer that if you're buying a non-proprietary product. It, it needs to have an anti-strip. It needs to be compacted. And uh, my opinion, sometimes the most expensive one is the cheapest in the long run. But uh, it, goes, it goes back that if you've got a good local produced material, it's got the anti-strip, it's got the right gradation, you know, it's, it's designed properly. It's just not... Oh, I got some leftover uh, 
aggregate at the plant at the end of the year and I got a tanker load MC 250, I'm just going to mix them together and spit it out on the ground. You know, it's something that was engineered and designed. I think that it, they can perform if they're properly placed as good as the proprietary products. In fact, the state I used to work for, we basically stole the, the uh, gradation and stuff and from uh, some of the proprietary ones that mimicked it in their patching spec. Hot mix. I'm biased toward patching with hot mix. Uh, because my goal is to make a patch that lasts at least six months, and hopefully it lasts two or three years. So being this hot mix, it's going to have lower air voids. One of the characteristics of a good cold patch is the ability to be able to shovel it or cold mix when it's cold. And in order to do that, it's got to be more of a gap graded. If it's a dense graded mix, in other words, it's got all the fines in it like regular hot mix paving heads. When it's cold, you can't push a shovel in it. So being it's got lower hot mix, it's got lower air void, it's easier to make it waterproof. It's easier to handle when it's hot. It's more stable if it's properly compacted. In other words, you take, uh, and I'm going to talk about it in another section, but I'll talk about it now. You take a good half inch minus hot mix with uh, normally for paving grade you use four percent air void uh, you lower it to three percent air voids which gets more liquid asphalt in it you place it in there you compact it it and it's got a high percentage crushing so it's like a level three or level four super pave it's going to last it's going to last so so can anybody tell me, and I wish I could give you a prize, what's wrong with this picture? Some of the things I see right is they uh, they cut the patch out up there toward the John Deere skid loader. It looks like they've tacked it, but uh, what's wrong with this picture? Dale? And so Brian in our room says no safety vests. Well, that yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah, they do have a cone, but I, there yeah. The big issue I've got is you look at the bottom of the picture, and it may be this isn't one of my pictures, but I got it from another guy. It looks like they've segregated the mix. So, and I'm going to talk in the paving I, about loading dump trucks, and you guys are all going to say, why do I need to know how to load a dump truck? So what I'm guessing happened is the patch started at the bottom of the picture because it looks like it's getting finer the further they go. They took the skid loader and they reached over the back of the tailgate of the dump truck. And if you load the dump truck wrong, all the coarse aggregates there. So what's going to happen when I compact that? That area of moisture is going to go in through that coarse mix and it's going to cause that patch to ravel. It, I mean, patching or paving hot mix can be easy if you pay attention to all the little details. But when I seen this picture in the shoe that works with me was there, and she, oh, that looks pretty good. And I said, well, look at the segregation. And I explained to her what I was seeing. And that's something that you need to take care if you buy quality material to handle it properly so that you don't... Uh, lower the performance of it. So we'll just back up a little bit. Uh, throw a roll, Pat. Go ahead. So we do, and, and by the way, Gerard, our, our expert, he picked up segregation right away. I was just uh, yep. you know, the expert. I was not passing on his words. We were trying to glean from others. And so how do you prevent this segregation? What, what should they have done? Well, that's a tandem truck. They should load it in three dumps. So, and Gerard can correct me, but uh, normally you load a, 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 a dump in the front, a dump in the back, and a dump in the center. Now, I would probably, and it's a little more work, 
but instead of reaching over top of the tailgate with the skid loader, I would probably dump some of the mix. I would back the truck up and dump some of the mix right into the hole so that I get that top crust mixed with some of the stuff underneath it because when you reach over the top and I'm trying to show it with my hand, you uh you end you end up uh uh, just get in the cold area there. And I see somebody talked about pulled along the edge. Yes, that they need to be a lot fussier about how they're raking it. And it's sort of hard to tell on the perspective. But all that stuff by the guy's foot that's on the other old mix, that all's got to be cleaned up. And it needs to have a tight edge. And if I was doing this patch after we got it raked out smooth, I would take the roller and I would go around and pinch the edges first and then start working my way across to, to compact it. And there's several different uh, thoughts on how to compact it there. So sorry about that uh, for folks there. If I'm a little disjointed, uh, uh, I broke my wrist Monday and I'm on pain medicine. So I jump around a little bit. So. Just for the audience, what? just so the audience knows, yes, you broke your wrist. Not only did you do that, you shifted your surgery to tomorrow so that you could be with us today. So big thanks. Well, well, yeah, well, this was important. So the wrist is a wrist. Thank you. Uh, throw roll procedure number one. If you're going to do a throw, and I and it should be place and roll place because when you throw mix with a shovel. Guess which particles travel the furthest? The biggest. So you can segregate it by just shoveling. Remove the water, remove the debris from the pothole, place the hot mix or the cold asphalt mix. Maximum lift thicknesses of two inches or less, an inch and a half, two inches. If you got three inch deep, I would do it in two inch and a half lifts. I talk about this is. The place and roll patching procedure, use a truck or, or a vibratory plate compactor if it's small. Bring it up, lift there, smooth it out, rake it out, put your second lift on and compact it. And like I say, and I talked about this before, that just by using the truck, you can increase the performance by up to 50% over just throwing it in and driving off. Permanent patching. You need to mark out the area to be patched. So if, let's say I've got a, a three foot by four foot uh, pothole. And around the edges of it, eh, it looks a little gnarly. It looks like my skin. It's getting sort of dried up and crackly and stuff. Do I just cut the hole out that three by four? No, you need to get back to good pavement. And I know I work with a lot of people with parking lots, and when they got somebody in to patch the parking lot, they only want to patch where the hole is. They don't want to go that extra foot out to cut it out to get the sound material. So cut it out, make square corners, remove the damaged pavement. I'm a big fan of using a milling machine. Uh, I don't see a lot of people sawing edges anymore, but these little uh, mills that go on uh, bobcats and skid loaders do a nice job. They give you a nice square face there. Uh, when I started in the business, we were jackhammering and uh, there, but you need to prepare the patch for what needs to be patched. You need to clean the area. Cleanliness is next to godliness. At a bare minimum, you need to pick all the millings or all the debris out. You need to sweep it out there. If the patch, when you cut it out, you find it goes all the, the hole goes all the way through the pavement, and you've got uh, aggregate base that's not firm or anything, you may need to remove some of the aggregate base and place more aggregate base in there or maybe some fabric and some more aggregate base. Because if you're got a street with four inches of hot mix 
it and it's normally built over six or seven inches of gravel over the native soil and when it's done right it's able to carry the load but if you've got an area where the for some reason the aggregate has gotten contaminated with the clay from underneath to where that four uh five or six inches of gravel is no longer there just putting uh, another four inches of hot mix over it's just going to fail so your house your foundation starts at the bottom and you need to fix it if you got a water issue you need to look at your water issue and see how you can fix it the next thing after you got the base area all taken care of you know it's clean there you need to tack the bottom and the sides and it needs to be applied uniformly uh, if i was a city or a county i would look at getting a, a small distributor or if you've got a big distributor getting a good hand one and doing a nice job of tacking and then like i say place don't throw place the hot mix in lifts no greater than two inches throwing causes segregation level the mix now when i talk about level and spend your time get it smooth look at compact each lift and check your final height now and gerard you can disagree with me but a patch that's been properly rolled that's slightly lower than the surrounding area maybe an eighth of an inch lower will ride smoother than one that's an eighth of an inch or a quarter inch high. And a lot of old timers say, oh, we're gonna hump it up high so the traffic will pound it down. No, put it in in lifts, get it compacted down, get it as close to level as you can, but if you're gonna air after it's been compacted and under traffic, it should be slight cup there because the suspension on a car does a better job of going down than it, or handling a dip than it does handling an up, a hump. And Tom Jones is with you. What? Gerard agrees. Gerard agrees. Yep. And uh, when we were doing night maintenance for my three and a half years, because I told an engineer he was an idiot and I used an adjective I shouldn't have used, uh, we built attachments for our skid loaders and we had uh, being working on state highway we had some pretty uniform size patches we had to put in so we built basically a, a strike off screed that there where we could dump the mix out in, in the pothole and we could take a skid loader and like a paver screed we could strike it off and when we started the night there the milling guys would mill and we'd determine how deep we're going to mill we'd patch the first one and then we'd adjust how high up so that they were perfect. And literally one of the materials engineers there that uh, at a conference, he got up and he said, because ride is critical and they measure it with lasers. He said, that night maintenance crew, he said, is the only crew that I've ever seen can patch a road and make it smoother than what it was to start with. And they thought we were working hard. No, we were working smart. We were building equipment to allow us to get uniform patches and rides. Because if any of you folks have, a lot of you folks have raked the asphalt in the daytime, it's hard to see to get it right. Try doing it at night under artificial light. It's real tough. So, Tom, we've got a couple of questions if yep. we could jump in. So you're recommending two inches uh, maximum lift with that what do you recommend for aggregate uh, size half inch minus three eighths minus i i'm a big fan of either half or three eighths with a high percent crushing uh, because we know we'd like to have the two inch you know lift but a lot of times you the bottom you got three inches the bottom lift will be two inches or an inch and a half in the top if you got a finer gradation uh, you tend to it tends to force the hot mix contractors to put a little more AC in, and then the other thing, and I was going to talk about it later, but I can talk about it now, is if you're buying the mix and if you've got a good relationship with your hot mix producer, have them put an extra one percent AC or asphalt binder into the mix. But the advantage of the over a three quarter a three quarter inch crust aggregate would probably be a little bit stronger 
But when you get the hand raking it on top, you're going to be plucking rocks and you're going to be fighting it where that three eighths or half. And I personally like the half. Uh, you know, the top size is a half inch, so most of it's three eighths minus. It's they use it as a rake out. It's easy to get you a tight, smooth surface because what we're trying to do after we get it put in and get it struck off or raked smooth, we're trying to get it to seal. And the finer the mix is, the easier the rollers are to seal it to make it waterproof. And uh, one of the things I'm a big advocate of is after you get done rolling your patches, since you've got a distributor out there for tacking, fog seal the patch while it's still warm. Just give it a light spray of fog seal because there's all those micro fissures and stuff. And it's no matter how hard you work on trying to get density in a patch, it's hard to get good density. You know, so seal that surface so the water can't get in to cause it to ravel. So, so Tom, you, you mentioned to fog it while it's still warm. So we do have a question along that line. What's the ideal temperature for the asphalt for the patching? Oh, I would talk to the hot mix guys and see what their op optimum temperature is for paving. But I I would like it in that 270, 280. This would be a more of a question for Gerard. Uh, you know, if it gets down below, when you pick it up at the plant, if it's below 250 time you haul it and you shovel it out, it's going to be getting cold unless you got a hot box to keep it in. But I really don't like to see it above 320 because then you start to burn off the light ends of the asphalt binder. So, so what Gerard is recommending and what he's used is about 275 for end dumps. And then if they're running bellies, they're run, running a little hotter, yep. closer to 300. Yep. I can agree with that because when you drop the belly on the ground, it gets cold and stuff. And and uh, you'll see a temperature segregation. I've seen pictures uh, with, the ultra, uh, with the infrared cameras where you can see that temperature segregation from the material that was picked up off the windrow. So. But for patching, I... If I if I was going over there with a single axle dump truck and I was getting five six ton of mix, and I knew I had four patches that it was going to eat up all the mix, so I, it wasn't a case of driving all over the city. I'd want it in that 280 to 300 degree range minimum at the plant, and then I'd tarp it, you know, to try to hold heat in. And then, you know, the the we were when I ran night maintenance. We were fortunate. We had a local hot mix plant that had a silo that would they would fill the silo with a hundred ton of mix every night for us. We hauled it all in tandem. We were pretty well mechanicalized, so we got rid of the mix real fast. We'd spend the first four hours of the night or five setting traffic control up and prepping all the holes, and then we'd spend like an hour and a half patching and rolling. You know, we did all our prep all at once. You know, and you can't do that in a city or a county because your potholes aren't that close together. But we do the, all the prep, and then when, when we got the mix there, we got rid of it fast and, and stuff. And the warmer you can keep the mix, the easier it is to get density. The better density you get, the longer the patch is going to survive. And if you've got the proper height on it, you're not going to get rutting or shoving and stuff. And then, like I say, just to fog seal it, just to seal it up. And then it doesn't hurt if you've got a crack sealing crew out there. If you've done a good job making permanent patches, to go around and do a blow and go crack sealing around the edges, you know, just to seal them up, you know, stuff. So, so Tom, you bring up a good point. The the timing that you talked about, four to five hours for the prep and signing, and an hour and a half for the actual work. Yep. Well, that's a that's a paradigm shift for a lot of people that wanted to do the throw and go because they wanted production. They wanted a ton out versus yep. it takes three times, just like painting. It's yep. all the work is the prep. Mm -hmm. And and we need to shift the way we think or shift the way our supervisors think so that, that there is more effort put in the front. And you have a factor of three times for the yep. prep. So that's, but there again, I'm also making a patch that I want last five to seven years or until the pavement around it fails. And usually uh, transfers cracks were our big issue 
on the bituminous over concrete roads and they were failing. So we're doing a lot of them, milling them a foot wide and down to the concrete. We could literally make them last longer than the mix on both sides of them. And that was our goal was once we patched the road, we didn't want to have to go out there and patch what we had patched again until they did a, after they did a mill and overlay. And uh, I tell everybody, I can make a good patch. I know how to do it. I don't like doing it. I like doing preventive maintenance. So we'll talk about that a little later about preventing pothole stuff. So. Well, that's, that's a good metric to yeah. look at what you've done and get it to last longer than the pavement around it. I mean, that's, a, again, a new way to look at things that, yep. that can really help us. And if we're not getting it to last that long, what do we need to do? What do we need to change to make exactly. that happen? Exactly. And it's a lot of little things, you know, and stuff there. So look at this Tom, picture here with the glove. Tom, there's there. one more question if we can yep. before we yep. come to this. And that is, you know, what's the minimum milling depth that you'd have if you're running a half inch, highly fractured, uh, nice crushed material? What's that milling minimum? Oh, depth? I would, if, if the base of the mix, underneath is let's say you got four inches and and you've got just the top inch and a half lift is coming off you can mill an inch and a half to two inches you know make sure you get into sound material underneath it you know uh, if it's sound down to the inch being your hand placing the material and you're raking it you could go to an inch you get much less than an inch and your heat is going to be an issue you know losing heat and if it's like a half an inch, then you might want to look at a blow patcher, which I'm not a big fan of, but done properly, they can work. Uh, you might want to look at the infrared, some other stuff, so. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I just threw this picture in here. There's a glove and and you look at it and you go, okay, so that glove's nine inches long, 10 inches long, so. I cut that out two foot square, I'm good to go. No, you aren't, because if you look over to the right, look at the fatigue cracking showing up. To me, that one needs to be cut out bigger than what the picture is, as far as from right to left. Just, if you see cracking like that, and you're doing a permanent patch, get out past it. And sometimes, you may have to just do a temporary patch where you do just do the the main pothole, but you need to tell the boss, hey, that road's only got another year, maybe two, before we need to do a mill and overlay. Because when you get this type of uh, fatigue cracking showing, it's not it's not long for the earth. So, and here's and we don't have to spend a lot of time on there, but there's a little milling operation, and actually the county where I broke my uh, wrist the other day, they. Had uh, they did their first chip seal in 15 years, but they had a road where the longitudinal joints, paving joints, would travel back. Uh, I talked to the engineer a year ago and told her I said I thought it was too far gone. She said, what happens if we pass? So they came in with a little working mill like that. They milled out the areas where the construction joints were failing. Uh, they milled them three inches deep. They put the mix in in two inch and a half lifts. They did a nice job of tacking it. They did a great job of rolling it. And then when we got ready to chip seal it, and that's what I was helping the county get the chip sealing going Monday, we pre-treated all those long lines and all those patches. We shot it with a uh, tenth of a gallon of CSS, CRS2P. Uh, don't do it right now. I'm teaching class. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, they were just going to change my computer. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. But uh, we pre-treated it with a tenth of a gallon of CRS2P, and then we backed up and shot our regular shot rate over it because we know, even though they did a bang-up job of patching it three weeks ago, that the emulsion from the chip seal was going to soak down into it. It wasn't going to be there to hold the rock. Picture on the top left, I like. Uh, the center picture, number two, I like. Number five, the steel roller, I'm liking that. Number three, sucks. That is a terrible job of tacking. It needs to look like a fog seal. 
Number four is all right. They're using a the paver to lay the mix, so it's going to be there. Number five, I really like it. How many of you folks, when you do do permanent patching, use a rubber tired roller? I'm a big fan of a rubber tired roller because a steel roller compacts from the top down. So most of your density is in the very top and it gets less as you get down. A rubber tired roller compacts from the bottom up. And when I was running night maintenance, we'd get these concrete blow ups with bituminous over concrete where the concrete would blow up and there was five, six inches of bituminous and then there was 12 inches of concrete. And we'd have to go out and mill out and cut out all the steel in the concrete. And these are on high volume roads like the Minneapolis airport area. And we couldn't get on them till nine o'clock. We had to have them open at five in the morning. And yeah, long story short, it used to be we'd put the mix in and lift, hit it with a steel roller, and then the next night we'd have to come back and top it off because it compacted the shove because it was hot. We'd even spray water on it to try to cool them off. An old guy worked for me that worked for Hennepin County before, and he said, oh, we used to run a rubber-tired roller on it. So we'd drug one out of the weed, and holy mackerel, we didn't have to water anymore. Using the combination steel and a rubber tired roller, we were able to put those six patches in and turn them to traffic when it's still 140 degrees and it didn't rut and shove. So, big fan of it. If you don't get anything out of this presentation, compaction, 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 compaction. And then, of course, my other favorite one is drainage, but we're not talking about drainage today. Poorly compacted patches will compact under traffic. In other words, they're going to rut, they're going to shove. Poor compaction results in raveling and shoveling. It allows water to infiltrate. So you do all the work of prepping the hole, tacking it, cleaning it, do all the prep work. You place the mix in, you buy a quality mix, whether it's cold mix or hot mix, but you do a poor job of patching it. You just wasted all your effort, in my opinion. Here, just to fit your vibratory there. Here, if your city, county, or state folks are talking about buying a new roller for patching, Ingersoll Ram, uh, Bow Mag, a bunch of them make them. They're a combination vibratory steel with rubber tire on it. Best of both worlds. You get the kneading action of the rubber tires. You get the, the smoothing sealing action of the vibratory steel drum. I just, uh, I wouldn't run a patching crew without one of those. The quality there, and actually, after we used uh, an old uh, seven wheel chip seal rubber tired roller, I was talking to the engineer I work for, and he says, well, how do you know you got better density? And that's back when I weighed about 440 pounds. And I told him, I said, well, if I roll it with a steel roller seven times, and I walk across it, my size nine and a half shoes sink in three quarters of an inch deep. And if I roll it four times with a rubber tired roller and four times with a steel roller. I walk across it and it's less than an eighth of an inch. And he said, well, what's that mean? I said, it means a 440 pound guy doesn't sink as far. And uh, so then we ended up bringing out a new gauge and we found that when we played with our rolling pattern, we could get up to the same density in our patches with the combination steel and rubber that the paving guys were getting on the paving. So if I want that patch to last as long as the mix around it, it needs to be similar density. And like I say, we had a 12-man crew and we're doing 100 to 120 tons of milling and patching every 10-hour night. And it took us an hour to an hour and 20 minutes to set up and another hour, an hour and 20 minutes every night to knock down traffic control. We A lot of nights we'd put over a thousand cones out to get our lane closure up on the high volume roads. So, I mean, and yet nobody worked hard. We worked smart. So here's just a, a little scenario. And, and uh, I sent this presentation to Dale. It'll be able to handle it. But it's from a from the L local road program. And they talk about throw and go standard patch the mix costs eighty one dollars uh, material if they did twenty times 
$1,600, labor's $800 and some dollars, equipment $250. The initial cost for trip one was $2,700. The survival rate of 10%, so that meant they had 90% they had to come back and refill. So then you look at, and their total cost after three trips was $7,300. And sixty-eight dollars. The second one was just use standard patch mix, and just roll it, and you'll see that they saved a couple hundred dollars on their total cost. And then they, on this study where they went to a proprietary patch, you can say they saved like thirteen hundred dollars. That's a substantial saving. But the big thing, and the reason why I put it in there, is look at the difference in the success rate on the survival rate between throw and go standard patch and throw and roll there there it's more than twice as much you know they went from 10% survival to 25% so that's like one and a half times more so that's pretty substantial adjusting iron you know there and I just threw a picture in there and it's since the um Animation doesn't work there, but they're using, they got a little milling machine and they're milling around it and cutting it out. Now, my one concern is I would have probably went a little deeper because it looks like they might have only went three quarters of an inch deep to adjust the iron. But yeah. infrared heaters, uh, the concept is you reheat the existing pavement uh, and you can make what they call a seamless patch. Uh, they say it works good to repair the top inch, inch and a half. It softens the existing asphalt with the infrared heater. You rake in new material as needed and compact. Uh, we've got a contractor that does a lot of that here in the Twin Cities. He buys regular hot mix in the fall of the year from one of the plants, and he has them put an extra 1% asphalt binder in. So if it was designed for paving at 5% and he buys it at six or six and a quarter percent, they spread it out in the yard, let it cool, and then they mill it up. And that's the new material they use to add back in there. It eliminates cutting out and hauling deteriorated materials. Uh, they say it eliminates tack coat. They say it results in a seamless repair. I have seen uh, infrared patches perform well. Uh, one of the big markets I see it in is in commercial parking lots, you know, where they come in and they got a hole here or there and they, there. One of the issues I had when we tried it out on the state highway was uh, uh, sometimes when you, if depending on what mix you're heating up existing, sometimes the mix stays tender and it tends to shove. But it is a tool there and here's just a picture of it and there's the heater and there they're heating the surface up and then they talk about if you want to go deeper you raise the heater up higher and the reason why is because if you got it down close you start to burn the top you want it to, the heat to soak in um, I like this uh, drawing this is for infrared but they show the pothole they show the area there and look at how much further out around they're going a minimum of six inches. That ought to be the minimum for milling and doing a mill and fill. I'm going to tell you my bias. Uh, blow patchers, infrared heaters, they're, they're a tool. They, they belong in the toolbox used properly. I'm a big fan of permanent patching with hot mix by milling. Uh, cleaning, placing, packing, placing, and compacting. Here's just a picture of it. Blow patchers. Um, and I and Craftco is going to be talking about them, right, Dale? That's correct. Blow patchers uh, can do a good job. Where I've seen them work is on the shallower patches. Uh, where I've seen people get in trouble is trying to do four or five inch deep potholes in the middle of the winter and the emulsion freezes up and then when it thaws out in the spring they shove. They're very dependent on the person 
running them. To get the right amount of emulsion, the right amount of aggregate. Uh, Minnesota DOT has a lot of truck mounted ones where they sit inside a cab. They're nice to run, it's safe to run. I personally like the trailer mounted one because then you can have somebody with a garden rake or a loot smooth them up because the traveling public does not like bumps. So, and here's just some pictures of it there. You blow out the dirt and, they're, and to me, these pictures are showing what they were designed for, real shallow patches. And to me, uh, what they're doing is they're they're filling that shallow area, but they're also sealing all the, if you look in the upper right, all those micro cracks and those small cracks. It's basically a air-driven, high-performance chip seal. And we're... We're probably running a little slow, but that's all right. So then there's self-contained patching units, uh, a lot of different hot boxes and stuff. Uh, I like hot boxes for hot mix for if you're patching where you got a hole here and then you got to drive a half mile to the next one. Just be careful to heat it gently. What, uh, especially the direct fired ones, what ends up happening is you can burn the binder off the mix at the very bottom of the trailer. Here's a neat uh, operation. It's got an air compressor running a jackhammer and stuff. We actually had a demo from an outfit from Canada about 15 years ago where it was an automated pothole patcher. It had a milling machine on, up underneath the front axle with a camera and it picked up the material and it there and it did everything there and it worked great as long as your potholes went straight down the road. But if you had a pothole where you needed to patch crossways, the thing was like 40 feet long. It wasn't real practical. But the guy, I give him credit for trying to invent it. So, so key points, prepare the pothole to be patched. Apply proper tack. Place patching material in patch. Compact in lifts if possible. Smooth surface taking care not to leave the patch high. Slight low patches ride better than bump up to. Once again, I'm repeating myself, compact in lifts. Density is important to the patch's life. Use quality materials and fog seal or seal the surface. So that's sort of, you know, and you guys, you got Gerard and you got the uh, Craftco guys, they'll be able to answer a bunch more of your questions and stuff. But that's sort of a uh, 10,000 foot look at patching. You know, we could spend hours talking about what makes good patching material and, and stuff. But to me, the key points are prep the area for the patch, be willing to go out further to where you're in good payment, cut it out, clean it. Uh, place it, compact it. Stuff. I got a question here about a manufacturing center. We build them ourselves. Uh, Mitch, give me a, a get uh, my phone number from Dale, and I'll I'll explain to you how we built it. If it, it was a couple chunks of uh, of um, four inch angle iron and a little welding and amazing it was a v thing that just hooked on the bucket that i i can talk you through it wonderful this is awesome information and we're ready for a quick break right tom yep, yep i need so let's, to yep. let's so. take a, a five minute stretch break and yep. we'll, we'll come back for part two thank okay. you tom nice Sounds job <laughs>
love the title, Tom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sort of a kit. Hey, Tom, this, the safety portion, are you going to do that in part two, this yep, part? Yep, I'm going to do it right now. Okay. All right. We're good. Okay. And then we'll kick into the chip shield video at the start of section three. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dustin, you just about, are we good to go? Are we ready? Everything looks good. All right. So we are, we are back. Tom, you ready? Yep. All right. We're back. And as we get started in the next section, perfect time to uh, type in any questions or comments in the Q&A. I love how everybody was participating throughout. Please continue to do that. As you can see, Tom loves to answer the questions. And again, we've got Gerard in our, our room here, and he's willing and wanting to help. So I'm not seeing anything. Tom, I, I, I love your summary and, it, and the, the takeaways that uh, you brought forward. Absolutely density. The only one density fact that I, or the one tidbit that I always remember is a 1% density improvement is, equates to a 10% pavement life. Yep. It's crazy. Our effort on density really allows us to get those patches to last longer than the surrounding pavement. That was your secret. That was what you were trying to share. So with okay, that, I'll turn well, it back to you, Tom. Yeah, we're going to have a little commercial. Uh, safety is uh, near and dear to me. And I'm going to originally uh, at the pavement conference, Dale was going to have me do a little talk about a incident we had. And uh, I just want to read something to you because uh, we get out and we're working on the roads and we go, oh, I'm only going to be there for 30 seconds. I don't need a vest. I don't need traffic control, whatever. So anyhow, on October 3rd, 2018, started out as a normal day for six employees at WSP. Little did they know that before the day was over, their life would never be the same. At approximately 2 p.m., a distracted driver rear-ended another vehicle that had slowed down to drive through the work zone. The resulting the results of the crash were one employee was killed, one other employee suffered minor injuries. The traffic control was set up properly and all cautions were taken. But the life of all involved has changed for the rest of their life. But the tales. The effects of the accident are much longer. One was a frantic call from a co-worker who was driving the opposite direction immediately after the accident and witnessed the carnage and knew that some of her co-workers were working on the project. She was in tears when she reached me and wanted to know if we were okay. And I had to inform her, no, we were not. There is a wife who lost the love of her life that day. There's a distracted driver going to prison causing the accident. Not one of the people involved planned for a drastic change to their life to happen that an accident, an incident can cause. They may even have thought, it can't happen to me. What a surprise. So the key points I want you to take away from this are the following. It can happen to you. It happened to me. Make sure you use proper and appropriate traffic control and PPE. The layouts in the manual for uniform traffic control devices are the minimum. You can always go above it. Plan your work to minimize your exposure to traffic. If possible, close the road. To quote John Jacobs, retired MnDOT traffic engineer, the safest traffic control is not being on the road i.e. limit the number of times you're working in live traffic as possible. That's the reason why I'm a big proponent of permanent patches. Pay attention and be careful. The life you save may be yours. I'm sad to say this is not the only time I was involved in a work zone accident involving a fatality. I hope and pray you never are involved in one. Be safe. Well, that's my commercial. It only takes a second to change everybody's life drastically. Tom, that's uh, 
a crazy story. And uh, yeah, living through it, I can't believe it. I can't understand it. I hope I never have to. Well, we've all been around minor stuff, but stuff like that is crazy. So yep. 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 we can hear the story from Tom. We can hear it from others. Uh, we should just create that safety, that, that safety switch, that cultural change, the desire to watch out for our teammates before we have to live with that. Because I could tell you were struggling reading it. I, I can't imagine moving on with life. It never leaves you. And, and you're right. Somebody lost a, a spouse. Somebody's in jail. They, no one wins. And certainly we as humans don't win when, uh, you know, a, a vehicle, an armed weapon basically comes at us no matter what the speed, even the 30 miles an hour like you addressed earlier. Yep. Safety is something that we talk about being job number one. Often we aren't really walking, walking the talk. Yep. So your well, message is, is perfect. Yeah, and the problem is we think it's going to happen to somebody else. And I was that somebody else twice. You know, I was luckily the one that was minorly injured. I should have been the one killed. I was in the worst place. But good Lord had some other reason for me to be around. I don't know what. But anyhow, just be careful, guys and gals. Be careful. Pavement, paving or pavement potpourri. So we're going to talk a little bit about forensics. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mixes for parking lots, driveways, but it also mixes for patching. We're going to talk about pack, segregation of mix, and my favorite subject, density. So if you work for a city, county, township, the state, and you're in the maintenance deal, you know your roads better than a lot of the people in the head office there. Try to get involved when they're doing project planning. And if if they are doing a, a plan of mill and overlay or something, have them do some forensics. This is a, a picture of a supposedly a two inch mill and overlay over a road that the developer built at four inches. And they milled too off, and you see what we got. So you need to evaluate what you got because we don't have x-ray vision. We need to know how thick the pavement is. We need to know what condition the HMA is, what the bottom lifts look, how thick they are. And if, as a maintenance personnel, if you can get involved helping the construction side plan projects, you're going to be able to address issues that they don't know about. And that was the last district I was a maintenance supervisor in. When they started scoping any project in the, in that area that I was responsible for, I was involved in every meeting. What's the drainage issues? Uh, what sight line issues? What, what are you doing? They wanted to know what we knew because we're the folks that are out there every day. And, and looking back, and knowing what I know now, if I was a maintenance supervisor, I would have had a little coring rig just to go out and pop a few cores to see what's going on. But you learn stuff over 30 years. So, so here's some of the surprises on roads that we core. We do a lot of forensic work in our group here at WSC. Both these uh, roads, the uh, owner wanted to do just an uh, inch and a half mill and fill. If you look at the core on the left side, what do you think is going to happen? If you look at the one on the right side, the bottom of the mix is falling apart. They're going to have a big surprise, and that's going to cost them a lot of money. And you can learn a lot by just popping a couple cores out there. And, and maybe, you know, and a lot of agencies have a, a core rig that they use it for drilling concrete for putting signposts in uh, boulevards or medians or islands and stuff. Just get an asphalt barrel for it and a water tank and you've got a core rig. So there's a lot of opportunities if you do coring. Here's a here's one that uh, block cracking uh, really dried up. The cores themselves weren't terrible, but they wanted to know if they could do full depth reclamation. And so then we did some hand augering, and you'll see that we had 
we had a yellow limestone, and then we got into a more of a red sand underneath, and we were able to tell them there. So that's just the more knowledge you have, and a lot of you are saying, well, I don't do that. Well, you may in the future. You may become a leader. You may become the supervisor or superintendent or the public uh, works director. And the more you know about this other stuff, the better your project can be designed and less surprises you have. So I'm going to talk about mixed recommendations for parking lots, trails, and patching. Uh, the alphabet soup, uh, most of you have heard of super pave, that's the current mix uh, deal. So the SP stands for super pave, that's a gyratory compacted mix design. The WE in most states stands for wear. If it's NW, that's non wear. The A in Minnesota's case is the gradation size, and the A aggregate is, and I'll get the book out here, an A is a half inch minus. The next number, the four, in the, uh, most every state that uses super pave uses, that's the level, the traffic level. So that's a level four. The highest level is level five. I like a level four mix because it's got a lot of crushing in it. Uh, a level three has got less crushing. It's probably a little easier to rake, but it's probably not quite as stable. The next two numbers, three zero is the air voids compacted or what it's designed for. So it's designed to the 3% air void. Normal paving mix, it would be a 4.0 or 4%. For patching parking lots and rec trails, I like the 3.0 because it's easier to get density and it's a richer mix where it's not going to ravel as easy. It's going to be more durable. And then in Minnesota, the C is the, the PG graded performance grade asphalt binder. So that would be a 58 minus 34 binder. And go to your local state and you can get their alphabet soup uh, there because they may use a little different letters than we do. But the key things on it is the size of mix. I want a half inch mix. I want a high percentage crushing even for patching because I want it to be a, a durable mix. I want 3% air voids because that adds more asphalt, which is going to make it uh, less subject to stripping from water, and then the fog sealing. And then parking lots, one of the reasons why we go with the, the level four is if people park in the same spot all the time and you get static loading depression. And if you drive across the, uh, an older parking lot, those crossways of parking bays, it, you can feel every one of those places where the car tires are set. So we're trying to limit that. Are there any questions on patching mix? Not seen any, Tom. Okay. What, the, what do you guys think of this tack job? I, we have, it didn't work. Well, I can tell you if you went out and looked at this parking lot, I believe it's a parking lot, eight, nine years ago, you're going to see crack. And you're going to have a crack pattern. You're going to wonder what in the heck caused them. Because what's going to happen is where the tacks at, they're bonded together, and then in between, you're going to end up with a uh, crack. And rural interstate shoulders, we used to get a uh, longitudinal crack about every seven inches, seven to eight inches, and they were perfectly straight, and everybody tried to figure it out. So a guy named Roger Olson and I, we went out and saw cut one and took it apart. And what it was is they dribbled the tack longitudinally, and so the cracks were halfway between the dribbles. So in other words, they glued the mat together where the tack was at, and then the expansion and contraction and the movement was able to move between the cracks. So that was neat there. 
this is how it should look. Uh, this is a, actually a city crew doing the edge milling and and uh, paving. Uh, if it had been my project, I would have cut this area out ahead of time and either put some more aggregate in this down here at the lower left where it's failing or else put some thicker uh, bit there. Uh, a gentleman named Earl and Lukeland, to me is a retired MnDOT engineer and pavement expert. He numerous times made the statement that we lose up to 25% of our payment life because of poor bonding on our tax. That's huge. 25% of the payment's life just because we didn't do a good job of tacking. You know, you take, and I'm a big boy, I weigh 285. You take two tuba fours, put them eight foot two before and you put them on top of a cup of concrete block lay them flat and I stand on them they'll bend all the way to the ground if I take and put about four or five nails in spikes in there it'll bend about halfway to the ground but if I take them apart and I smear good carpenter's glue on it and, uh, clamp them together and let the glue here, I can jump up and down and they won't bend at all. And our pavement structure, it depends on being a monolithic pavement structure. So if you do a shallow patch, two inch deep patch, and you don't tack it, that two inch patch is dealing with all the strain by itself, but if it's glued to the pavement underneath, now the three inches or two inches underneath it, now you're dealing with four inches. So it's like that two before glued together. It's so critical to, to tack and bond them together. Oh, a dirty, a dirty other little secret too. We went back to this picture here, but you'll see the longitudinal streak the paving guys will do. And a lot of times when you check their yield, they're putting the right amount of tack down. They're putting their five, six hundredths of a gallon per square yard diluted. But they're putting it in dribbles and they're complaining about how long it takes to cure. Well, if they take and they spray it out uniform at the same application rate per square yard, so they they use the same amount of material, but they apply it uniformly, it'll cure and break faster. So if somebody bitches about a tack taking forever to break right away, I want to know how they applied it. Here's just another picture on the left. Uh, contrary, oh, that's a great job of tack. And of course, then we've all heard the story hot on hot. So the picture on the left is at the MnDOT Office of Materials and Road Research. They were repaving the back parking lot and being its research area. We had them make one pull for the, the last pull of the wear, base course. They paved it. They rolled it. We had them then turn around immediately after they got done rolling it and put the wear course on it. And uh, they're in the country. Oh, yeah, that'll be great. A couple of days later, we went out and saw cut it, and it fell apart. There was no bond whatsoever. So. There was a case where two inch and a half lifts were working independently and they're not going to perform. Well, Tom, what do you do in the, you know, on the parking lot? You probably didn't, maybe didn't have a lot of traffic, but on a roadway, you've got traffic there. How do you, uh, how do you manage the tack? Do you ever need to retack? I'm not quite sure. Uh, when you're tacking on a roadway, they just got to have a flagging operation. And, Get it down, let it cure. Yep. Keep the vehicles off it then? Yep. And I have, and I know that the India, industry experts say that it, oh, once it starts to break and it's not cured, you can run on it. So I have a little heartburn with that because if it's picking up on the dump trucks in front of the paver, you're removing the tack and you're making a dissimilar surface, in my opinion. But uh, most of the experts will tell you I'm wrong. But, yeah, maybe I am. But 
I think if I'm gluing my two by fours together, I want it. I want the four in, or three and a half inches of the two by four uniformly bonded to each other. So. Tom, I think your logic's good, and you know we're all going to be questioned in what we're doing, uh, whether it's working or not. But uh, yeah, your logic is there that we need to have the glue in place to bond the two together. And I love your analogy with the two by fours. And, and it leads to one of the comments that we had from our group that uh, you used to be outspoken and when was used to be outspoken was the, was the comment, uh, you still are, that, and that's good to state really what you see and what you feel. So thank you for doing that. Oh, no, no problem. One of the neat things that's common and hopefully it's going to get more prevalent is the spray pavers. Uh, Caterpillar now has a retrofit one where they've actually got a distributor spray bar that goes right in front of the augers in this where the mix drops. And so then you get an attack on it and everybody says, well, it's not broken. Well, you put 300 degree mix on it and the water flashes out of the attack immediately. And, and I've had people, well, you're gonna trap moisture in there. Well, a good paver is go with a good uh, vibratory screed should get you in Gerard, you can crack me, 80 to 85% density. I've seen the numbers in there. So that's really good. So that's behind the paving screed with the vibratory compactor running. So when the mix falls off the table of the paver in front of the augers, what's the air voids in it? Probably 50%. You know, it's loose. You know, so any moisture when that mix hits, that steam's going to go right up through it there. And then I've had uh, Guys say, oh, yeah, but you're trapping water in there. So you're shooting, uh, let's say, 1,200 to a gallon with a spray paver at 30% at, uh, residual. So you're shooting 800 of a gallon uh, uh, of water. I see the same contractor that says you can't do that with tack will be out there in the light and light to moderate rain paving pushing there but anyhow tom, tom can you describe a spray paper what are you actually talking about it's uh yeah and you can look it up a uh, road tack or vulgarly build them uh caterpillar's got a retrofit so you got your paving screed you got your auger you got the tractor or the paver and then in that area there's a uh, distributor bar so right in front of the, where the mix drops onto the road, in front of the augers, there's a, a distributor bar that applies the tack. And uh, the ones that are purposely built, they've got tanks on them, and then they're a little longer, so they got room for the distributor bar. So, and I don't know whether I can find a picture real quick, but but uh, they were developed for the ultra thin bolted wearing course of the Nova chip wearing course but uh mindots used them on a lot of dense graded mix and it works real well so what happens is no trucks drive on the tack you don't have to wait on the tack to break because as soon as that hot mix that falls off the table of the paver in front of the augers hits it it flashes a little bit of water in the tack out and the tack is thermally bonded to the mix and it's just uh I, I see it as being the future. It's just, another another good way to ensure that you've got complete and pack that's in place. Exactly. Coverage with the pack in place. Nice. Yep. Tom, if we could, we've got a question of backing yep. up just a little bit, but there are some proprietary products out there. And one claims that uh, you can put the asphalt down, uh, you densify it a little bit, and then you put some water on it and rake it out, and it's for concrete or asphalt patches. And it it cures out. Have you seen those proprietary I, products? I uh, be honest with you, I'm getting a little uh, as far as the proprietary patching. I'm getting a little dated on that. Uh, I don't do a lot of work with that. I've heard of some patch in the buckets. I've heard of some water activated stuff. I know in the uh, racing deal there's a lot of the sealants we use for making gaskets or 
or water activated now and stuff. So it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, what I would do if somebody comes out with that new product, I'd ask them to do a demo and do a fair demo. You know, pick some potholes or areas that they say are a good candidate and do it that way and then do similar ones the way you're doing it and see how they, they work. I am I always tell everybody, I'm not against new products, but if you're selling me a new product, explain to me how your new product's going to solve a problem I haven't solved. And if you can do that, I'm on board. Uh, if your new product doesn't solve a problem I've or it mimics what I've already solved. Does it perform better? If it does, I'm on board. Uh, is it easier? I'm on board. You know, but if it's just a new product and it doesn't do anything different than what I'm currently doing, and it costs more, I'm probably going to stay with doing what I'm doing if I'm getting the performance I need. But, but it needs to be evaluated, and the suppliers need to have some skin in the game. But on the defense of the suppliers, you as an agency need to be realistic. If you have a, somebody come out and do a bunch of patching today and it works fine six months from now, don't ask them to do another free demo. You need to pony up and pay them because they got to make a living too and it costs money to develop new products. So it needs to be a partnership between the agency and the suppliers. And Tom, another another good way to look at it is not just everyone doing their own demo, because that is an absolute awesome way to do it, but recognize that others, other cities, other counties, and other yep. states. And, and in our state, Mike Kesey with North Dakota DOT Maintenance, he passed on yesterday that uh, they just took bids on some different mastics and, and the equipment and, and such on June 11th. And when the state does that, they do an awful lot of research and test products and and know what works and, and their materials vary across the state and in districts, some work better. So we've got a really good resource in the DOT. If you're, if you know your district uh, team leaders, man, tap into them, ask what they're using and ask if you can use their, their bid information because most suppliers will honor those state bid, bids that are out there. And, that, and that's so true, this bit of reinventing the wheel, and it used to drive me nuts when I was in research that Wisconsin would be doing something or North Dakota would be doing something that worked, and I'd say, well, why don't we try it here? Well, how do we know it's going to work in Minnesota? And that used to drive me nuts, and and it actually got down to uh, uh, on the road we had when the uh, – stimulus money came out uh, under the previous president, we had a district materials engineer who had a lot of bituminous over concrete, 27 foot joints. We've got the cracks coming through them. The overlays crack right away, wants to know what to do. And I told him, I said, well, why don't you put ultra thin bonded wearing course down, which is a gap graded polymer modified hot mix to put on with spray paper with a heavy asphalt membrane and it's just tougher nails. It's the brand name's Nova Chip. And I said, you got a test section over there on the west side of your district that shows it's working really great compared to, and it's in his own district, you know, compared to just the traditional bituminous over concrete overlay. And he said, well, yeah, but that's on the west side of the district. How do I know it's going to work on the east side of the district? And I said to him, do I have to build the test section right next to the road you're going to build? If your neighbor's doing something, ask them. Ask them. And uh, what ends up happening is Dale's crew starts using this new patching material, and they get they figure out how to use it, and they, they become the champion. They become the the spokesperson, and if I was marketing, those would be the people I'd say, hey, talk to Dale and his crew. They'll tell you how to use it, you know. And, you know, we can't all be the the leaders, but sometimes it, it doesn't hurt to be the follower, too, and ask. And, Tom, another good area for information is MinRoads, the, yep. the Minnesota Test Facility, part of NRRA, and and along with that, LRB, the research arm for, for Minnesota, 
a wealth of information. And they actually did, uh, Chris points out with Brock White, that they did a, a check in Minnesota at Minroads on the Aquapatch. That's the, yep. that's a proprietary based product. So good information there. So I have to brag, that's the new distributor we bought. But what's neat about that there is, look at how uniform a spray job he's doing with that old relic. So apply and tack, and I'm going to go back, and this is a fog seal over a chip seal, because if you want a picture of a beautiful tack job, you got to go watch a chip spreader, a uh, chipper, chip seal guy. And he's applying zero. 0 0.06 gallons of CSS 1.8 blue to 1 to 1. That's exactly the same TAC application rate that MnDOT recommends for non-milled surfaces. Look how uniform that is. So how do you get there? Proper size nozzle, correct bar height, all the nozzles angled the same, use, use all uh, nozzles. If you've got a paving contractor out there He's got every third nozzle on, and he tells you, or every fourth nozzle on, he can do it, kick him off the deal, and then correct ground speed. So, pack is critical, whether it's patching or paving, and, and a lot of times, I'm sure a lot of you folks, if you got a, a small paving job like your parking lot or there, you may end up doing the inspection. Just don't be a jerk. But be firm that you want the tack done right. The next topic that drives me nuts is segregation. Segregation in hot mix can be defined as the separation of the coarse aggregate particles in the mix from the rest of the mass. And I don't normally read definitions, but I'll read this one. And, but each type of segregation affects the long term durability of the asphalt structure. Interesting, when mixes were finer before the hot mix guys figured out that uh, at least in our state where they get paid by the ton, they don't get paid for the, the asphalt binder. They found out if they could go to coarser gradations on the gradation band, they could use less asphalt binder and they could make more money per ton. Uh, it was interesting, the bituminous engineer said, uh, uh, geez, I'm seeing segregation, he said, three or four weeks after they're paved. And I told him, I said, well, it's always been there. Because when you had the finer mix, it took six months to a year to show up. And that's when I would get the call from the district to go out and say, what's wrong with it? So you look at this road here, and uh, I'm not sure what caused the segregation, but you see how it's dry and how it's wet. Any place you got segregation, you're allowing moisture to go in there, and if moisture gets in the pavement, it's going to cause it to ravel. And uh, here's just some examples where they've done a blow patch, but you can see the segregation. And I'm thinking that's tipping the wings on the paver, and uh, it's not good. It shortens the life of the pavement. You know, Tom, yep. Tom and Mandan, we had a, a little bit of rain last night, just a little bit, so. Same with surfaces dried off for the most part this morning, but certainly the areas that you're showing here were readily apparent. Yep. Good time to check your roadway for yep. lack of density segregation areas and uh, mark them off because when it's hot out, when it's sunny out, you're not going to see them like this. Yep. No, that's a very good point, Dale. In fact, if you're driving around with somebody that's uh, there and you want to show them that you're a pavement expert and the pavement's drying up and it hasn't been chip sealed or surface sealed, you can tell them which side was paved first because the construction joint on the side paved first will be the last one to dry because it's the unconfined edge and it doesn't have the density. And so therefore that's going to be the area that's going to rot out first. So we talked about loading trucks, and Gerard, you can jump in here. They they talk about three dumps on a tandem truck, one in the front, one in the back, and one in the middle. Because if you put it in a one big pile, the mix rolls the front and rolls the back as the coarse type mix. So just something simple like that. 
there. Hopefully you folks can see, can you see the segregated areas in this picture? This is caused by the paver. This is caused by tipping the wings of the paver in, in that cold mix there. And so you can have physical separate, uh, segregation where you segregated the big rock from the little rock, or you can have temperature segregation. And either one of them is bad because what happens is uh, it's hard to get density, and you're going to have uh, more uh, water being able to in infiltrate the pavement. And here's just some pictures on the left is the, with the wings tipped in, and on the right you'll see this mix is coarser because when they dump it in the truck, the coarse stuff tends to run to the outside. They run down the road, and then they tip it in, and that mix is cold. And when it comes out on the in front of the augers, the augers take it out to the side, and as long as they're moving forward, it's the V-shaped uh, distress. So, so that's one of the things to watch for. If you see V-shaped, back up here, if you see these V-shaped deals, that's 99% of the time, that's from tipping the wings in on the paver. If you see a long line there, that's probably from the gearbox. They probably don't have the uh, tuck under deal on the auger that pushes mix back underneath the uh, gearbox. And some of the new pavers have, have gotten a lot better with that. Um, so here we are, we're doing our first pass. This is the unconfined edge. What do you think's happened in this mix here? That's two or three feet. The coarse aggregates ending up out here. And we know that coarse mixtures are harder to densify, take more effort, but if you got an unconfined edge, can you pound that hard? No. If I was king, I would require them, if they're doing mainline paving, I'd require them to put extensions on to within five, six inches of the end of the tailgate on the paver screen. Farmers aren't very smart. You know, farmers use augers to run grain up in the top of the band and if you get a auger for putting in a grain band and you look at the lighting and you look at the hole where the grain drops the auger lightings go two or three inches maybe a foot past the hole farmers have figured out it's easier to carry a material than it is to push it but remember they're just farmers so sorry for my smart ass comment Density, why do I care? And this goes back to what Dale said earlier. A Kentucky DOT research showed that increase that increase in density from 9% air void to 7% air void. In other words, from 91% uh, density to 93% can increase the life by 25% with dots. Wisconsin, uh, Washington DOT said basically you lose 1% increase in air void based over the 7% tends to reduce the life by 10%. So if I'm at, if my goal is to be 93% density or 7% air void, and I go to 92% density or 8% air voids, I'm going to lose at least 8% of the life. That's huge. That is huge. Factors that affect density. What's under the pavement? And this comes back to your patches. If you've got a aggregate underneath there and it's soft and squishy, you need to fix it because you can't compact your patch against a, a foam pad. You've got to have something solid. Number of rollers, type of rollers, weight of the rollers, temperature of the mix when you're rolling it, aggregate properties the more crushing you got the more effort you have to have to get density proper mix design and on a patching material i like to add up to one percent more asphalt binder because the asphalt binder as long as the mix is hot works like a lubricant and then the type of joints if you're doing paving will affect it and the temperature uh ambient and pavement uh temperature and then wind rain and snow so years ago, I was a plant inspector, and they built a new bridge in St. Paul across the Mississippi River, and the governor was going to come and open the ribbon, 
and we were going to pave the approaches on a Monday, and it was 30 degrees out in, in November, and they decided not to pave it. I was planting the factor Tuesday. It was 28 degrees. Decided not to pave it. It's too cold. Wednesday, it was 25 degrees. Decided not to there. Thursday, it was 25. Friday, it was snowing. It was 10 below zero when we paved it because the governor was going to be there on Saturday. So, yeah. It was amazing. Need a proper platform. So the picture on the left shows some wheel rutting. There in, on the right shows what happens. You get fatigue cracking immediately. And we've had some issues with contractors this spring where they just put the base course down in the winter and we had this type of cracking. They said, oh, we'll just put a, another lift to wear course on and it'll be fine. No, it's not going to be fine. So you need a sound foundation to build the road on. So, so that's the end of section two. You want to take a quick break here, Tom, or should we start in? Three? Let's start in the other one, and then if, uh, if I need to okay. do that. So, you want to show your video? Dale? Hello. Well, well, so let's take a five minute break okay. and then we'll show the video. Okay. Dustin, can you uh, help me get that started? Yep, I'll switch presenter over to you and then uh, for the video, you just share your screen. Share screen? Okay. Yep, yep, and then let's, pull up uh, the video. Let's test that right now. All right, you're the presenter now. Okay. So is audio on, Dustin? So Dustin, were you able to hear audio? Uh, the video is not playing, so I can't hear the audio. I st I stopped it, but did you hear it? I did not. Okay, how do I get that going? Press play again. I'll just let it run for a bit. There we go. There we have it. Okay. I turned it up. So I can just... So crank it there. I should be ready. Yep. Okay. You might have to turn it up a little bit, but it's not too bad. That's all the way. Right? Any other way? Better? You can see full screen now? Yep. Okay. Then stopping, when I stop sharing, how do I do that when I'm done? You'll, you'll just switch to Tom? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, that'd be awesome. Tom, does that work for you? Roller, like roller 
So, Tom, are you back? I'm back. All right, Tom, it sounds like you're you're back with us. Yep. All right. Good time. You ready to, re- yep. to restart? Yep. Okay. Dustin, I'll start the video, and then after I'm done, if you switch back to Tom, that'd be perfect. can stop it now, Dale. Yeah, you're on, Tom. Okay. So just I'm going to cover several things there, but uh, like it said at the end of the video, when to apply a chip seal. Well, we built an aging study and uh, where we took a one-year-old payment. We divided it in one-mile segments. We put a chip seal on every year until uh, it was five years old. We monitored it. We wanted to see the effect of aging and uh, performance of a uh, Payment preventative maintenance like a chip seal would have and try to determine the best time. Uh, the joke was because it took 15 years to, because 15 years takes 15 years. My boss was complaining it'd take too long to get the data, and I told him if we waited, it'd still take 15 years. So three inches of the level, three super pay of 58, 28. We cored it in 2011. We had the Asphalt Institute study the characteristics, and this is just the layout. This mile post got chips here at year one, year two, year three, year four. Control section was never treated, and then 
down here it'd be nine to ten and on down the road got all chip sealed because the district chip seals at year five took the cores removed any chip seal off the top now these cores could not have any cracks they had to be pristine cores we cut them into slices one inch thick top is the top inch the second inch is the bottom and we tested it for fracture energy and the concept of fracture energy is the higher the energy the less prone to cracking the mix is going to be and this is the device you drill holes down here in the lower right you drill holes you cut a slice you put it in this device at a certain temperature you put a load on it and you record the time and energy it takes to propagate the crack through where the red line is on the lower right and this is in joules of energy so the control section the blue column on the left is control section so it took 151 joules to cause it to crack the section next to it the one-year-old section took 277 joules so that's a like 10 times less likely to crack the third column over was year two 208 and then the fourth and the fifth column were year three and four and basically they were back the same so what that shows you as far as fracture energy you need to do it within the first three years or it really doesn't affect the fracture energy the neat thing i seen about this was i'd always been told the surface treatments don't work i.e fog seals and chip seals because they only seal the surface and the aging only affects the top quarter inch of the pavement well if that was true the second the red lines would should be all the same because that's the second inch down so that's from one inch to two inches and if you look at the curve on it, yeah, the control section's higher. It's 179 or 180. But uh, one year, 308, 275. You know, so basically, they're the same. So what that tells me is the environmental aging away from cracks, because there couldn't be any cracks in the pavement, cause fracture energy to decrease or incre decrease a lot deeper into the pavement in other words the environmental aging goes way deeper in the pavement uh, so three years as far as fracture energy and it's probably not gaining you anything one to two years shows the best as far as related to cracking okay so then we look at the ride data and i'm going to compare this the mile right next to the uh, control section because they've got the same traffic it's got the same lay of the land there so this is inches per mile uh, new pavement should be somewhere between 40 and 50 inches this contractor did a good job so the control section is red and as you can see it's 30 inches a mile it started out smoother than the uh, chip sealed section and you get out here at year five, 2005, that's when the chip seal was put on, and they're both about the same, and you watch it. And out here at year 2010, they went in, maintenance went in and did a sand patch, uh, leveling the transverse cracks. And you'll see within one year, the ride has fallen back off. They didn't get anything for the money they spent. And we get out of here at year 14, and you look at the spread, and we're looking at at least five years life extension. The NRRA, National Road, National Road Research Alliance, has a new study out where they've looked at the pavement management data and, uh, done by Bernard Isner and Shu Lee. And that's, uh, you can Google it. And it's showing up to eight years life extension with a single chip seal pretty dramatic so now we'll go to the eye doctor this is what the control section looks see all the cracks and down here is the chip sealed section so option a option b option a option b so so it basically tells you anytime from zero to five it pays to put a surface treatment on the laboratory data supports it pavement management ride data support it and your visual support it. So I think it's a pretty strong uh, yeah. 
So then the question is, is the cost effective? Now this is new construction is the is the blue column on the left, uh inflated and then in two thousand and five and that was using fifty five dollar a ton mix. And so this is how many years a chip seal would have to extend to life to be cost effective. So new construction uh, with the cost of chip seals at the time I put this graph together on new construction, it would probably have to extend to life for the payment four tenths of a year there. And if I inflate that to, to 2013 values, it was three tenths of a year. In other words, it was uh, three months almost four months. Uh, a thin overlay, $55 a ton mix, no mill, got to get three years, should get three years. A heavy mill and fill, $60 a ton mix, a chip seal, got to extend the life 2.4 years. And you can do this yourself. You just take the cost of the chip seal and you divide it by the yearly cost of your uh, payment. So if you got a 20 year payment, it costs you Fifty dollars a ton. It's you figure out the cost per square yard per year, and it will tell you the how long it's going to extend life. But basically, the reason why I put that in is I wanted to show you that surface treatments are very inexpensive to do, and they don't have most of them don't have to extend the life of the pavement very long. I had one for crack sealing, and I think it's like on new construction, it's like three weeks is all it's got to extend the life of the pavement be cost effective and we know it does better than that. Fog sealing, what is a fog seal? Benefit of fog seal and construction issues and we're running a little long on time so we'll move right through it. It's a light uniform application asphalt emulsion. It's normally CSS 1H, uh, cationic. Uh, it's diluted for lower viscosity for better infiltration. Over a chip seal, it's somewhere between six hundredths of a gallon diluted up to two tenths. In other words, if I got a chip seal I built and I swept it and I look at it after traffic's been on it, and I can see I'm light on a uh, asphalt binder to hold the chips, I can up the fog seal shot rate. This picture here shows why. This is a road where you can see in a wheel pass the chip seal looks tight, but we had snow plow damage between the wheel paths. Uh, that was pretty common before we fog sealed because nobody drives in the wheel path, uh, between the wheel paths. There, this is a similar condition road with, with a chip seal with a fog on it. And you'll see the center line looks good. It's very similar to the other road. So how? Well, it increases the residual asphalt by adding a tenth of a gallon at 300. There on uh, three tenths, you're increasing the binder by 10 to 15 percent binder. It also accelerates the cure by painting the surface black. You're able to get the chips needed around on their least dimension easier. And then there's a combination of soft elastomeric polymer modified asphalt underneath with a hard brittle asphalt on top. It acts like an M&M. &M. It makes it more resistant to snow clouds. Other benefits, it locks down marginally embedded uh, Chips. The county just did the county road a couple blocks from my house. It's about 8,000 ADT. They chip sealed it Monday. That's where I broke my wrist. They swept it Monday. They fogged part of it Monday. When I drove on it Tuesday, there was no loose rock. Makes pavement markings show up better. Uh, we double lapped the center line so we reduced the amount of paint. Last but not least, it's Customer thinks it's a new pavement, not a chip seal. They like it. There. Construction issues, no rain within three hours. Environmental conditions dictate the speed of cure, proper size nozzles, uniform application, properly functioning equipment and qualified operators. Overlap the center line by at least a foot both ways because snow plows attack the center line. Uh, if you got if you're a city, you got cul-de-sacs. I wouldn't even chip seal them. I'd just fog seal them. It works. We don't want it looking like this. We sure don't want our tack looking like that. This is what the traffic public sees four or five months afterward. This is a high volume road, three eighths inch granite chip seal, fog, fog center. Here's the same road five years later. 
hardly any snow plow damage. And that's a bare pavement road. In other words, it has to be bare from fog line to fog line before they quit plowing snow. Tom, treatment. We, Go ahead. Tom, so th this was amazing. When you first brought in Minroads, you brought this concept into North Dakota. It was a game changer for us. And not everybody's doing it. Most areas in North Dakota are doing a really nice job. But, but the thought that we should seal right uh, right after pavement, paving a new project or as close to the paving year as possible, it, it was a big shift for us. And then fogging, wow, what a yeah. game changer that's been. And, and you know what? The public does perceive that as pavement, so that's a higher level of treatment, so they're happier. The ride is perceived to be better. And even in, you know, we had a few years ago when, when you pass this on, Bowman County, a small county in the southwest corner of our state, started doing the fog ceiling on a very remote rural roadway the public's perception was that it was pavement and they didn't receive for the first time ever on a seal coat any complaints about loose rocks uh, broken windshields it was holding the chips down and the public was happy if you haven't read the study or or want more information about what tom just talked about we we should get that to you because those two things, ceiling right after paving and fogging are big to make a big difference in your program. To tell a funny story, uh, when we started the fog ceiling and uh, still knew a lot of the maintenance superintendents around the state, they hadn't retired yet, was at the pavement conference in the fall and uh, Dean Olson was the name of Fountain Morris and Dean says, I got a bone to pick with you, Thomas Woods. And I thought, uh-oh, what did I do wrong? He said, that fog seal. And I said, what's wrong with it? Well, why didn't you tell us this four or five years before? And he started chewing on me pretty good about it. Why did it take so long to get it going and stuff? And, well, you don't know what you don't know. You know, you got to learn. And the uh, area maintenance engineer was standing there, and the area maintenance engineer said, well, where'd you do that? And Dean started there, and they were doing about $4 million worth of chip seals on state highways a year. And he started rattling off there. And the area maintenance engineer says, Dean, I was going to talk to you and ask you where you got all the money to do the thin overlay. Now, we had an internal MnDOT engineer that couldn't tell the difference. And I'm not saying the road was any smoother or not, but the perception was there that it was better. And that district, our, our, our quantities of state highway chip seals have been going down. But part of the reason why they're going down is we're not overlaying roads. And uh, one of our big chip seal contractors was bitching about it. And I said to him, I said, well, geez, they got everything in chip seal. You know, so, so it's very, you know, very cost effective but there. And hopefully we'll do a, another chip seal class one of these days where we'll really get into the weeds. So. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, you bet. Well, you got Chris Stubbe with uh, Brock White or Crafco going to talk, and so he's 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 one of the guys I go to when I have questions like cracks. One, but why are we treating cracks? Well, we want to keep water out of the sub basin and all the pavement. We want to prevent incompressibles. It improves ride quality and it slows down. Payment deterioration is very cost effective. Like I said earlier on, if you did that life cycle deal, it's probably three or four weeks is all to have to extend the life of the payment to be cost effective on new construction. Why should I treat crack? Well, the payment's your largest investment. Uh, payment failure is going to happen if you let water through it. Uh, there's a study that showed it's cost effective up to uh, nine years and they extend payment's life. If you only have money to do one thing as far as preventative maintenance there, I would tell you get all your crack ceiling caught up first because you can do so many more miles of road for the dollar there. And then you go to your surface treatments like a chip seal or whatever. But if money is tight, you can only do part, try to get your crack ceiling caught up. Why? Dale talked about water don't jump. I just love this picture. It's amazing how the water evaporates right at that crack. Uh, when, as soon as they appear, 
you know, realistically, if you got one crack a mile, if you're doing the work yourself, you might feel it. But when you get a reasonable crack pattern on new construction with the proper PG grading, that might be year three or four, depending on what to do. And it's minimum all cracks equal to or greater than that eighth of an inch. Uh, there again, another picture. Just can't stress enough, we don't want water in the pavement. And another one. And then there's incompressibles. You get dirt into those cracks, and then when it gets hot, the road humps up. If you get tanning in the wintertime where the road humps up in the wintertime, that's because salt brine has got down there, and the ice crystals of salt water are bigger than the fresh water, and it causes the road to tan up and make it rough. Crack sealing. So there's clean and seal, and there's crack sealing. I'm going to talk about crack sealing first. This is where you Used on thermal cracks, you create a reservoir in Minnesota is the three quarter by three quarter. We're looking at pavements in good condition. The transfers cracks facing at least 20 feet apart from mine or other cracks there. The sealants are flexible and extensive at the lowest temperature encountered. In other words, we're trying to keep it sealed year round. Thermal cracks are temperature related. They're generally transfers or perpendicular to the center line, uh, should be greater than 20 feet. Uh, they're considered working cracks. I'm one of those that working, non-working, all cracks need to be filled. Uh, develop two to seven years on new pavements, one to three on the two minutes over concrete. Actually, that's one to three weeks. That was a joke. The typical thermal crack, uh, if you're going to route it, at least Try to route an eighth of an inch on each side. Uh, keep it centered over the crack. Use as many cutters as possible. Hopefully, the Craftco folks will talk about setting up routers and stuff tomorrow. Router recommendations. Uh, there's three main types. There's a one by one. In other words, a width and depth are the same, no overband. Uh, some people like it because they think it's a little quieter. The one I like is a one by one. The uh, width and depth are the same with a tight, thin overband. And then up in Canada, they do a lot of four to one, where it's four times wider than the depth with a thin overband. Performance wise, the last one is probably the best because it's got the most sealant to be able to handle the movement, but they will slap. You can get a noisy road, so it becomes a compromise. Uh, Crack filling, this is where you blow the crack out and you fill it, but you don't create a reservoir. And the idea is you're trying to keep it sealed during the warm weather, but realizing the cracks can open up in the wintertime. And normally it's longitudinal block or keep cracking or transfers cracks less than 20 foot facing. Um, you need to use a stiffer, more traffic resistant product. And the overband needs to be uh, thin and tight. And if it's poor condition, I probably wouldn't crack seal it. I might look at doing a double chip seal or do a uh, scrub seal or something else. So I've covered that there. So there's a typical longitudinal crack. I would not route longitudinal cracks because you risk the uh, sealant picking up on the tires. There I would, there's no hardly any movement. I'd just do a clean and seal. Uh, here's fatigue cracking. Uh, I, since I don't sell sealant, I wouldn't recommend this road. It could be a safety hazard with motorcyclists riding on it and stuff. So, so it's just a little bit over still there. Uh, definitely not a candidate for a crack sealing. This airport approached me when I was still at MnDOT, wanted to know if they could chip seal the parking lot. And I said, no, that area needs a patch. Well, we'll just crack seal it first. So large cracks, what do you do with large cracks? Well, there's products out there called Mastic, where it's a hot pour with an aggregate in it. I am really impressed. When properly used, they do a good job of filling wide cracks, like uh, over an inch wide, um, leveling uh, cup cracks. In order to get the ride, you probably should do it in two passes. But there again, I'll, I'll uh, Go along with what Craftco recommends. They've got one of the products and stuff. 
stuff is really tough. It's uh, really a durable product and stuff. But make sure you got it hot enough. Make sure you squeegee it down smooth because I know one particular road I drive every once in a while, the maintenance force didn't have it hot enough. They left the lip on each side and it's been there about six, seven years and you still feel the thump thump. Remember I talked about a patch that was down rides better than an up? Well, in this case, they got up, down, up, down. So it's a thump thump. Well, here's just another picture of it. Great product used properly. I'm not sure about this picture here. It looks like it's dragging a little bit, but I don't know the situation. The other thing, and I'm not here to sell Crafco, but but well, they were one of the first companies to come up and start to tailor their sealants for the different areas of the state, uh, country. In other words, the 522 that they make for North Dakota is different than the 522 road savers that they make in Arizona. That's neat. And if you go to their website, there's a lot of great information and there's a, how to figure out poundage and all that stuff. So. So just briefly, a cohesive failure, that's where the sealant didn't stick to the sidewall. Or wait a minute, cohesive failure, back up, pain medicine, is when the sealant tears and adhesive is when it comes off the side. And so those are the two types you'll hear or somebody will ask you if you got a failure, is it adhesive? And that's where it didn't stick to the pavement. And cohesive is where it tore in the center. Uh, Choices of installation or route or not. If you're going to route what size, you need to do clean, rest, recess, flush, and overband. Federal highways said overbands perform the best. Uh, to me, there's three main, since I teach around the country, there's three main classifications of sealant. They got ASTM numbers, but I don't know them. There's a crumb rubber. Uh, that's uh, for clean and seal, that's probably the most forgiving as far as sticking, but it's the uh, least stretchy. When they test it, they put it between a concrete block, a half an inch thick, they cool it down to zero degrees F, they stretch it three times. A half, so it's a half an inch thick, they go to three quarters of an inch, so they stretch it a quarter inch three times in 24 hours. If it tears off or it tears in the middle, it failed. The next Category is the low modulus. It can be used for clean and seal or route and seal. It's more stretchy there again. Uh, it's, it needs a better job of preparing the cracks. If you're doing a clean and seal, you got to make sure you got them clean and dry. Uh, crumb rubber, they should be clean and dry, but it, it's a little more forgiving. Uh, you pour it a half an inch thick between the concrete blocks. Special blocks to cool it down to zero. You stretch it to a 100% extension. So you go from a half to an inch, a half to an inch three times. There again, if it doesn't come off the blocks or it doesn't tear, it passes. So it's a lot more stretchy. And then the extra low modulus is only for transverse cracks. This stuff needs very good job of cleaning and preparing the rotted reservoirs. If, if, if everything's right, it's a very good product. You pour it that half an inch, you cool it to 20 below zero F, and you extend it 200%. So you go from a half an inch to an inch and a half three times. So it's a lot more stretchy. But the more stretchy or the more able to relax or lower modulus you have, you give up the ability to bond. You know, So it's a compromise. But there again, talk to your sealant suppliers if you're doing the work and get their recommendations and stuff. Basics of all installation needs to be clean, needs to be dried. It rained this morning. The rain quit at 7 o'clock. The road was dry by 7.30. You start crack sealing? Probably not because the cracks are the last thing to dry up. You need to have impact, intact pavement. You know, we're not trying to glue a, a fatigue failing road there. Ordian rising application of sealant at uh, manufacturers recommended temperatures. Uh, cleaning methods, you can route, you can saw, you need to have enough uh, uh, air compressor with some, enough pressure and velocity to clean the crack reservoir. It needs to have air dryers so you don't put oil or water on it. 
Uh, some parts of the country are using vacuum in combination with compressed air. Uh, heat lamps can help. They condition the pavement. They don't dry it, in my opinion. What they do is they make it tacky. Uh, and over a beer, we can discuss what a heat lamp does. Picture on the left's not clean. The picture on the right is clean. Uh, sealing application, overband, maximum thickness, an eighth of an inch and a sixteenth of an inch is better. Maximum width on each side of the crack is three quarters of an inch. So if you're doing a three quarter inch route, you'd be two and a quarter inches, so two and a half inches. You want to keep it thin, sharp. Federal Highway says that overbands crack seal seals the best. Here's a neat, clean application. Here's a non routed clean and fill. Real nice job there. We don't want it to look like this. Something about airport people. So, uh, your equipment should all be oil jacket, thermostatically controlled, continuous agitation, controls for overheating. Talk, if you're new to crack sealing or crack filling, talk to your heater manufacturer, talk to your sealant supplier, ask them how long you can heat the material, how many times you can reheat it, what the recommended pouring temperatures are. They know their product better than anybody else does. And then Dale's favorite picture, asking water to jump a crack. Uh, you got to seal that joint. Uh, Min Road, where they did a study between a concrete pavement and asphalt shoulders, uh, they sealed the joint and they seen it. I think it was 85 or 90 percent reduction in the water flowing through their drain tiles with uh, tipping buckets. Huge. One of the things we do here at WSB is when we do a mill and overlay on our municipal stuff, we're using uh, Craftco's joint adhesive. It's made for the center lines. We're pre-treating the face of the concrete curb so we get it sealed all the way down. We're very impressed with how well that works. So, summary of why crack treat, prevent water intrusion to the sub base. Keeps the strength. And one of the things I forgot to mention is when you got an open crack, and if you use de-icing chemicals and the roads are starting to thaw in the spring of the year, the crack will thaw out first because the icing chemicals go down through the crack. Prevents incompressibles, improves ride, slows pavement deterioration. It's very cost effective. Uh, steps you got to evaluate whether you're going to do clean and seal or, or uh, route and Feel. Look at your high and low temperatures. Select the product and the proper application. So, with that, that was a real quick overview on that. Uh, Tom, I've got time for a few questions, Dale. Yeah. So, any tips for cleaning, blowing out, or vacuuming in a city? You know, it's tough when you go up to the curb line. You're you're shooting towards the houses. It's tough enough trying to work around vehicles. Any yeah. thing that you see? What I see, and I was out actually inspecting some of this spring crack sealant. Uh, what the contractor did on this one is they went through and routed it, and then they had a kicker broom, you know, one of them ones underneath like you use on a chip seal, and they swept it first with, uh, you know, so and they swept it hard, you know, and they windrowed that in the belly pan of the curb. And the guy went slow along the curb. You know, he didn't have the broom going fast to kick it up in the yard. Then they did their clean and and then they did the seal. And then after they got done all sealing it and the, the, put the detackification or toilet paper on it, then they came back later with the broom and kicked off what little stuff the air compressor blew out. And there again, they didn't run the the, the Brussels, the broom itself, the RPMs of it up very high. You know, they just sort of pushed the material over, and then, and uh, in that city, the city came back later and picked it up with a Pelican type pickup broom. And then the, there's the new crack sealing equipment that really helps with overband. Uh, what do you recommend? What do you see that really works well to do a nice overband? I, well, I see 
some of the sealant uh, kettle manufacturers make a disc that goes on the end that gets it there. The one contractor I watch, he makes his own. He's got a round disc that's about two and three quarter inch diameter, slightly cupped, and then it's got a it's got a pipe that if you set it on the ground. It's got a pipe sticking straight up a couple inches high, maybe three inches high. And then it's got a place where the nozzle of the wand goes in and hooks in there. So he's got a reservoir. And so when he's there, and so the first pass, they take uh, just a plain nipple on the wand. They, this contractor runs two cattle. And he went through with a nipple. And he filled the reservoir half, three quarters full on the first pass. And then three or four minutes later, the second melter came with this cup device on it and did the overband. And by doing that, they're able to get closer to a level fill because if you try to do it all in once, the sealant sags on you because it's hot and it runs. That makes sense. Thank you. Tom, what is the picture? Okay, that is my the reason why I'm still working. That's my light limited super stock. And actually, that's in Mountain, North Dakota. We went up the Icelandic festival last year in Poland. So that's what keeps me young. <laughs> and the tractor on the left there is the guy that I bought this my tractor chassis off of and stuff and. I talked to him on the phone the other day, and he said, I wish I hadn't sold you my old tractor. And I said, yeah, Dave. So. <laughs> hey, uh, if there's no more questions, I'm going to let you no. go. But otherwise, thanks for your time. And uh, just do quality work. Even if it takes a little longer in the long run, you're better off. And be safe. Be safe. There's too many cell phones. There's too many people not paying attention, and uh, it's just not it's just not worth it. So Tom, we're gonna we're gonna post this recording on the LTAP website, and we're gonna post your presentation. That's a, that's good, right? Yep. We're good yep. with it. Thank you. And on there, we're gonna add your if it's okay with you, add your contact information. So please do. Yep. Please do. Because you're an awesome resource now with phones and the way we can run Zoom in the field. A uh, good idea if you're calling Tom and want some advice or calling Gerard. Gerard is right here in the state, can touch it. But send a picture, send a quick video, run live. That's the way our experts can help uh, figure out our problems in the field best. And so along with the being recorded, uh, this is part one of our series. We've got, well, we're gonna take an hour break. We're coming back at one o'clock for the next webinar. And then tomorrow we've got a class for our select few that are gonna be uh, doing our live demonstrations in the field. And Tom, I want to say a big thank you. Broken wrists, shifting your surgery. That's absolutely amazing. That's the dedication. And uh, so glad that you speak so frankly. And I love the way you explain stuff, that, uh, the kind of stories that, that resonate and plant seeds for me. Well, thank you, Dale. And thank you, folks, for your most valuable commodity, your time. And and, and last but certainly not least, thank you to Dustin, Denise, in the background for, for getting our webinar up and running, keeping us on track, and most importantly to everyone attending. Thank you for attending. Thank you for learning. I hope and um, ask that you take and challenge yourself, apply some of these things, and uh, make your roadway smoother for the general public. The smoother they are, the happier they are, and that's our, that's our job as public servants. So with that, that's a wrap for this session. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, audience. Have a great and safe day. We'll see you at 1 o'clock.